Hi, hello everyone. My name is Marissa Sage. I'm director of the University Art Museum at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm so super excited about this performance and I'm so happy to see all of you here. Uh, this, um, our, we had our first Alone Together performance last week with Joey Farso. Uh, we had a really beautiful crash of all of these different sculptures. Um, so Alone Together is a, is a series of Saturday online performances, readings, programming that we're doing in conjunction with the exhibition, which is currently closed, but hopefully will reopen soon in the University Art Museum titled Labor, Motherhood and Art 2020. Labor, Motherhood and Art in 2020 is a co-curation by myself and the artist Laurel Nakadati out of New York. It's an exhibition that Laurel and I uh, had been working on for about two years. And the, the, the concept of the exhibition was looking at the past, present, and future of laboring as both a mother and an artist simultaneously in our global society. Thinking about that through the lens of art history, as well as current practicing artists who are talking about motherhood, incorporating motherhood into their practice, and or incorporating their children into their practice. And thinking about how we might change the conversation of how we address mothering and motherhood in the art world, in our practice throughout our global arts community, and also within our more local and regional communities. So a lot of the exhibition also focused on um, current practicing artists who are using forms of social practice and or um, asking the community to be part of their practice in some way. And so many of the artworks that are in labor, which we do hope to reopen um, somewhat soon, you know, as things progress and we can, we can begin to uh, social distance in a different way. Um, a lot of the pieces actually ask our community and people who walk into the exhibition to be part of that exhibition in some way. And so alone together, this series that this performance is part of um, really came out of the idea of how do we make sure since the first exhibition, which was based around motherhood and women artists, how do we make sure that we still, that are, that are integrating um, different forms of social practice, sculpture, painting, photography into their, into their, um, their practice? How do we make sure that we still connect with our community? How do we make sure that we still continue these forms of conversations and start thinking about our community as a global community that we could potentially reach now online? in this COVID crisis time where we are all social distancing and connecting in different ways online. Um, and so what I did was I made a phone call, emails with different artists and different artist groups that became part of the exhibition Labor, Motherhood and Art in 2020 in some way. Um, and this group, which I am so excited to introduce, um, was one of the groups that I connected with through labor, the exhibition labor. And so this, this group is titled Art Practice, Mother Practice. There are 12 artists that are practicing, laboring as artists and mothers in the New Mexico region. They are um, as far reaching as um, Santa Fe, Albuquerque, um, Las Cruces, where we are right now. Shout out to Las Cruces artists. Um, out, uh, I said a Bernalillo, uh, Rio Rancho. So um, they're all over New Mexico, mothers, uh, mostly in the Northern region, because the group was actually formed by Mira Burak, who had this beautiful exhibition at 516 Arts, when we all got together and we got to meet each other. And, and Mira, um, who I started to speak about this performance, reached out to all of these 12 artists, spectacular artists who you're gonna hear readings from and see performances from, and asked them to write about um, the, how, they, to, how they're supporting one another 
um, how they are surviving through um, many of them having to now not only be working mothers and artists mothers, uh, but also homeschooling their parent, their children, um, or potentially living far apart from their children who were very instrumental in their lives. Um, so really asking them to negotiate these concepts of isolation and togetherness and personal experiences within this current climate of COVID-19. Um, so without further ado, I hope that all of you who are with us from all around what seems the world, and we're very excited about that, and the country are able to physically join us in the University Museum when we open back up to come see Labor Motherhood and Art in 2020. But without further ado, I would like to introduce these fantastic 12 artists and see their works. We're going to begin with an artist named Danila Remold. So I'm going to now mute myself. And I'm going to be reciting a loving kindness prayer today, and I want to invite you, the audience, to participate by sending your own prayers to Marissa Sage, whose email address you can find on the UNMS Art Museum website, and along with your address, and I will write it down on these strips of dyed canvas and mail them back to you. Thank you. Loving ourselves back together. May I be safe and protected. May I accept myself with all my imperfections. May I break the trance of unworthiness. May I be sober and awake. May I be free of pain and suffering. And may I touch great natural peace and freedom in being alone together. May she be safe and protected. May she accept herself with all her imperfections. May she break the trance of unworthiness. May she be awake and filled with loving kindness. May she be free of pain and suffering. And may she touch great natural peace and freedom in being alone together. May you be safe and protected. May you accept yourself in all your imperfections. May you break the trance of unworthiness. May you be awake and filled with loving kindness. May you be free of pain and suffering. And may you touch great natural peace and freedom in being alone together. May he be safe and protected. May he accept himself in all his imperfections. May he break the trance of unworthiness. May he be awake and filled with loving kindness. May he be free of pain and suffering. And may he touch great natural peace and freedom in being alone together. May all beings be safe and protected. May all beings accept themselves in all their imperfections. May all beings break from the trance of unworthiness. May all beings be awake and filled with loving kindness. May all beings be free of pain and suffering. And may all beings find great natural peace and freedom in being alone together. Beautiful, Daniela. Thank you so much. That was absolutely gorgeous. So again, just for anyone who just came in at the end of the performance, we will unmute you so that you could show your admiration. But of course, you can clap, you can, you can snap, and we will see you. So thank you. 
So our next artist is Tayus Mather. Being alone is a discipline. If I were to define myself from the last three years, that would be my statement. When we begin to truly become critical of our world as intellectuals, sometimes it propels us to question more than just theory. I looked so many times at my iPhone seeking a message. I looked so many times at clothing seeking armor. I looked so many times at myself the self as me, my self. I looked for someone who could talk small. I looked for someone who could smile fake. I looked for someone who could be a woman, be a woman, be a woman. And I found no one. I found not a soul, not a sight of her. Where is she? Where is she? I avoided her, I avoided him, I avoided they, they avoided me. Being alone is a discipline, to be truly alone and quiet, and to really look, not just see, and to really speak, not just talk, and to really frown, not just smile, to really be a woman, be a woman, be a woman. Botox. I researched Botox yesterday. I thought about how I could inject myself with hatred, society's hatred of me, in my face, in my smile, in my fake smile, in my worried eyes, in my frightened forehead, erasure. I started drawing these dots. I drew thousands of them millions of them, dot, 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 dot. I sat in my study and I drew dots for four years. I looked at humanity and it was looking at me. In dots, it looked, it looked. It said, it was. I found her. I looked at myself. The self is me, my self. I was pregnant with all of these dots. I thought about being a mother. I dreamt about being a mother. I dream about being a mother. I felt the swell, the dot. It grew, it grew large, it grew larger. In the quiet, I heard myself creating the dot. I heard myself loving the dot. I made dots. They made me, we make it all, we as women, and then we lose it all as women. We created humanity. What a cruel trick for your own creation to hate you. Perhaps no one remembers that we created it, humanity. We don't have to create, but they make us. We don't need conspiracy. Our own lives are ugly enough. I started drawing dots to be quiet. They are so quiet, just a dot. Just millions of dots, now seven billion dots. I wanted to know if I could be a mother because I realize that I am so hated as part of my race, womankind. I wanted to know that I could love and not be hate and not create more because if I create more, dot, 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 dot. Images throughout all of history, images throughout all of time, prehistory, mankind. They made themselves, we made ourselves, we made this civilization. Existent is just a dot, a small little dot. That was very beautiful, Thais. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> so our next artist will be Sharbani Dasgupta. Oh, 
Hello. Um, I'm waiting for 10 seconds. And in that time, my title is Waiting to Exhale. It's a piece I've written and um, I appreciate being made to think about it. Waiting to Exhale. Stillness. Time has suddenly stopped, turned still. It is an unsettled stillness, like a holding of a breath, awaiting to exhale. Yet each day keeps melting into the next, and I keep waking up unsure of when the previous one disappeared. The ground is shifting, I think, and there are more questions than I have the wisdom to answer. So for the moment, I concentrate on balancing. A hand of love, sanitized, of course, on an anxious son's shoulder. A hug shared with my daughter. Soothing words for my mother isolated in a room a million miles away. I talk with my husband across an elastic distance of six feet. We can see each other but cannot touch. His medical calling fills him with the purpose of the moment and I understand, but for the first time it is scary. So I turn my thoughts away towards being alone together in a world that is shifting. I don't want this overwhelming tide, the tolling news, the escalations of contagion and rising panic to be the kryptonite for the only power left to me, my empathy. I'm keenly aware that despite being locked into the footprints of our homes, our families are expanding far beyond the ties of blood as strangers care for loved ones outside our reach and every soul lost becomes one of our own. Friendships, some as old as my youth and some formed since, have become my anchors, mooring and reorienting me. Alone, together, talking and emoji smiling over waves of doubt, I am watching as the world learns to be gentle, to stay present, to see each other. We tell jokes and stories and play music. We share wine over many miles and release our love and anger. We link astral paths, forming safety nets that share the burden of a weightless present, and we wait to exhale. In the stillness of this moment, as our restless movement is stayed, the Earth's crust has stopped shaking. Time outside of us carries on reassuringly. Mexican poppies have gilded wide swaths of the mountain in gold, and old grizzled men stop to look at them. The cactus plants have started blooming in lipstick hues of red, and there have been two series of mourning dove families occupying the nest outside my window. The light in the studio and the smell of clay has begun to penetrate my shop. And slowly, I have started to reorganize. Slowly, re-familiarize myself with the contours of its walls. I feel an urge to burrow, to seek light by sinking in. I want to try and make art that I can frame between my two hands, that I can carry like a talisman. Bring this time into what is to come. Sharbani, absolutely beautiful, absolutely spectacular. Thank you. So our next video will be by an artist, Isadora Stowe. Isadora, if you could just thank you. Um, Isadora is, is showing a video, and so I will share the screen. It's Friday, March 13th, 2020. I called in sick that day to work, not knowing it would be the last day I would see my students and colleagues indefinitely. Because I had a cough and runny nose and I didn't want to risk getting anyone sick. And also I'm a little scared. I go get the mail from my dad's house, keeping six feet away just in case. I catch the worry in his eyes. He tells me he is high risk and he may not make it through this. One of my brothers, a toxicologist at Columbia Medical in New York City had spoken to him at length. My father won't see me again until all this is over. I wave goodbye to my dad, my stepmom, from a distance. It was just the beginning of all of this for us in our New Mexican town that day. COVID felt far away, and maybe, just maybe, everyone is being a little too alarmist. But my brother, the doctor, calls to set the record straight. His emotion withheld. 
Now it is my turn to hear in detail of all that is to eventually unfold before the public predictions and announcements would come out. I get off the phone with him. It all seems so much of an untenable race with time. My heart races. I can't breathe. Is it the illness? Is it stress? I try not to watch the news, but at 2, 3, and 4 a.m., I find myself searching for anything that will keep me ahead of COVID, any information that will help me and my 15-year-old survive this. I buy water. I buy a generator, a battery-powered radio. I see if I can buy a gun online. I thought I was against owning firearms. I'm racked with fear. I also have developed a low-grade fever. My child announces they don't want to stay home with me anymore in isolation. They want to go with their dad, who I left seven years earlier, who promises no more isolation, no more rules like their mom. They pack to go. I plead not to. Still with fever, I try to negotiate with both of them in every way. They don't listen. I'm disregarded as hysterical, not to be trusted. I don't sleep. I'm torn. I think of all the things I didn't say, didn't do correctly to come to this moment of failed negotiation. If this is the last time I see them, have I done enough? Have I said all the things I should have? Is this it? My memories become vivid. I remember bringing my child home from the hospital, growing them into an adolescent, feeding them, all the nuances, all the big, big things in waves. I'm awakened by dreams woven in and out of memories of choices I've made. Did that happen? Was that real? Sometimes my dreams are predictions of what happens the next day. Am I psychic? Am I losing it? Is this what it is to be alone? No one there who can verify your reality? What about all the sacrifices and strides I made in my career? Are they lost? I don't know how to mourn that. Alone, finally alone with my thoughts, uninterrupted by all the things I used to get to lose time in, all the caretaking, all the things that had such meaning and urgency. Who am I without those things? I can't think linear, it seems. I can't see time. I go outside and jump on the new trampoline I try to bribe my child with to stay. I walk barefoot through the yard. I dig up weeds in the dirt. I clean the yard. I clean the house. I clean the ceiling. I bake banana bread. I eat by myself. I go for walks by myself in the quiet of my neighborhood. I get quieter. I watch clouds move while laying on the trampoline. Time seems different. I start to remember time as I did as a child. I try to remember my mother who has been gone for more than 30 years. Who was she? What would she think of all of this? I try and remember my grandmother, her skin, her smell, and her old world ways, and worries about times like these she predicted would surely come. I am glad they never saw this time. At least there is that for them. I try to comfort myself. I meditate more. It's harder, but I need it more frequently. I watch different tutorials on how to breathe. I start to look at all the things that bother me so much and I don't feel their weight anymore. Is it because I am numb? Is it because I am grieving? Or am I evolving? I meet with friends six feet or more away, divided by a literal and metaphorical ditch, and I try to really listen to them. And I remember how much and why I love them. I think in earnest, walking on the ditch bank, how much I have gained by knowing them. I start to see everyone I encounter differently. My love seems to grow more for everyone. I realize how privileged I am. I take pleasure in things I didn't have time for. I see buildings in my town I never noticed. I watch large birds I can't identify in awe for 20 minutes as they communicate in the trees. I watch a sunset and think about how it wasn't important to me before to feel the day slip into the night. I reread this poem by Michel de Montaigne. I remember it from a movie I watched not long ago. I want us to be doing things, prolonging life's duties as much as we can. I want death to find me planting my cabbages, neither worrying about it nor the unfinished gardening. I get a tightening in my chest. I breathe and I tell myself, I am planting my cabbages. I am planting my cabbages and we are all alone together. Thank you, Isadora. That was absolutely gorgeous. Very beautiful. So I would like to introduce artist Jessamine Lovell. Jessamine, please begin. Thanks. And I want to thank Marissa and Mira for curating and editing and putting all this together for and with us. How to work from home while homeschooling your child during a pandemic. To be read for a remote audience on Zoom against a tropical virtual background while drinking a glass of wine. Set a reasonable schedule that everyone in the family can follow, even your pets. Ideally, every single 
meal, snack, drink of water, breath of fresh air, and poop should be scheduled for everyone on a whiteboard. This will avoid any confusion about what anyone is supposed to be doing at any given time. Clean out two. Clean out and reorganize a spare room, shed, basement, closet, porch, or other underutilized area in your home that you can now call your home office. The time required to make this happen will likely take the first several weeks of your new isolation, but I promise it will be worth it, especially when you can take the fifth conference call of the day without your child wandering in to ask for help with some complicated math problem involving fractions. This will probably happen anyway, but at least you tried. Always mute yourself during Zoom meetings, period. Even in your home office, noise will likely filter in, especially if you don't have an actual door. Another note about Zoom meetings, learn how to set up a virtual background to hide the state of your actual home office. I personally like the tropical island motif for obvious reasons, but you do you. Four, you'll need to practice your diplomatic responses to friends and colleagues when they suggest a last minute Zoom happy hour or dance party on Friday night. Although you may want to vent about how challenging homeschooling your child is, it's better to just to politely decline. Besides, your kid most likely needs your help to complete that DIY stuffed animal project you thought would be a good activity for creative time. Five, Get used to using food as a distraction for your child and also for yourself. Chocolate and wine are the only supplies that are okay to hoard. Ignore anyone who is concerned about gaining weight during this crisis. Who the fuck cares? Isn't the impending collapse of capitalism and the threat of death enough to let go of body image issues? Six. If you get a stimulus check, make your top priority to invest in a bidet attachment for your toilet seat. I know, I know. When if my friend described this as a spa in the form of a toilet, I was sold, totally sold. It extends the time you're allowed to use the bathroom for mindfulness training, and your butt has never been this clean. Seven, sign your kids up for Facebook Messenger so you don't have to schedule and facilitate all of their social interactions for the foreseeable future. The pandemic may have gotten you out of soccer practices for the season, but make no mistake, you'll now be on the hook for arranging their endless requests for Zoom meetings, Google Hangouts, and FaceTime meetups. Eight, plan on at least one major tantrum a week for your child, each child in your household. I call these quarantine meltdowns because although they commonly take the form of disobeying you for something deceptively simple, the crying, stomping, and screaming can last for hours and into the night because obviously it's much more about their newfound resistance. It's much about much more than their newfound resistance to your authority. Nine, however many kids you have, even if you have zero, by the way, however many kids you have, thank yourself and your partner every day that you did not have more before school was officially canceled forever. Even if you're only one, even if you only have one child like I do, your friends with more children can confirm, true story, that life would be exponentially harder with two or three, God forbid. 10. You might be tempted to make the mistake of putting off work until after your child is in bed. It's only natural, but it's safer not to count on this. Trust me, if you do this, your child will surely have one of their quarantine meltdowns because you asked them to brush their teeth. Again, true story. This will likely take at least an extra hour or so of helping them calm down. And if they ever get to sleep, you'll be so exhausted. The last thing you can do is work. 11. Let's face it, there are not many consequences to dole out for bad behavior at this point because the current state of existence just feels like one big grounding. Shout out to all my friends who are mothers and teenagers. One thing that helps me is to remind myself that bad behavior is just an expression of how fucked up they feel about the state of the world, like I do. If they really cross a line though, I suggest you get creative depending on their ages. And keep in mind, if you take something like their tablet away, that's gonna end up punishing you too. Right, think about it. I personally like to assign laps in the backyard to my seven-year-old. It simultaneously wears him down and gives me a few minutes to think. 12, even when you do not necessarily feel grateful for the shit show that your domestic sphere has become, 
maybe I'm just speaking for myself, make a gratitude post on Instagram as a sort of prayer that you can one day see the silver lining to all of this. The people posting on social media, their beautifully baked artisan breads and cooking extravagant meals for the first time just perfectly and growing their own vegetables in very well manicured backyards, they're living alone, not parents and likely superhuman. 13, be sure to celebrate every win. And I really mean this, even the seemingly small ones. You did a load of laundry, fantastic. You did the dishes, half of them, great. Pour yourself a glass of wine or tea and sit and stare at the wall for a breath or two. Beautiful, Desmond, beautiful. I would like to now introduce the artist Stephanie Lermer. The days alone together. Yesterday, the day dripped by, tears under my skin. I feel them cuddling in the worry and washing. But the girls maintain my balance, tender treasures keeping watch. I feel them embracing my edges from the distance. Today, at odds in this withdrawal, time just walking by, leaving me alone in the middle of everything. When on the verge of stillness and a whirl of silence, the phone rings and their voices dancing make me smile. Tomorrow, less a mother now than a privileged participant in their unfolding. No little backs to wash, no toes to tickle, old days tucked into memories, hiding in drawers. Hoping I gave them the tools to find joy, follow strength, and take movement through this remoteness and step safely forward into newness. Thank you, Stephanie. Beautiful. Uh, just um, to take a pause for a moment, because many people have come in since we started this performance. This performance is by um, the Artist Practice Mother Practice Group, 12 artists and mothers from the New Mexico region, all over the New Mexico region. We're right in the middle of the performances. Now we're halfway into the performances. Just for those of you who have just come in, what we've asked is that unless we tell you to be um, in gallery view, that you might go into speaker view, because the hope is that when the artist is performance, you're seeing their image, their performance as a larger screen. Um, at the end of the performance, we will turn um, audio on if you'd like to hooray or clap, um, but for now you are all muted. Um, and also a couple of people have asked in the chat if we can do a Q&A. Um, if the artists are so interested, those artists can stay in and um, we can try and run a little bit of a Q&A. Um, what we would then ask at that point is that we'll do kind of a raise our hand type of Q&A when we get to that point. But again, we're about halfway there um, and we're going to now introduce the artist Zoe Spiliotis. Zoe, I'm sorry, could you actually start the video over again? It's very low, we cannot hear it. Can you turn the audio up? I think it's all, already up, but let me see. Is it lower than it was before in practice?
as we all know, this is a new medium, so there's going to be hiccups. I don't really know. Would you like me to play it, Zoe? You can try playing it, sure. I have always enjoyed being alone. I spent a lot of time by myself as a latchkey child of the 80s. I had hours after school to pass the time relaxing, letting my mind wander, to contemplate ideas, to be creative, to occupy space and let my body exist without critique or judgment from myself or others, to be the most authentic version of myself. And this was because I was alone. I haven't been alone in about eight years, not since I became pregnant with my son. I wasn't alone during those months, not in my thoughts, which were mostly devoted to him, but I also lost any physical autonomy I had. Suddenly my body was responsible for two, and I've been together ever since. In my mind, thoughts of my children are broken only by brief moments to focus on other pressing matters, decisions waiting to be made, work needing to be completed, or artistic ideas. The things that make me a separate person outside of a mother. Sometimes it seems they are keenly aware of our togetherness, exploiting my primal body gripping urge to recognize and respond to their every noise, no matter how small. I'm rarely physically alone either. As any mother knows, you lose that type of alone while in labor and you never regain it. My kids want to be with me, on me, all the time, no matter what I'm doing. And for that, I guess I'm a little lucky that a few people think I'm amazing. One is sitting in my lap as I try to write this. How boring that must be. Yet here she sits. Secretly, I am a tiny bit jealous of those who get to live in their alone worlds and dedicate their time to pursuits that they are genuinely interested in and to follow a thought entirely through to the end without interruption and who are allowed an identity to the outside world as something other than mother first. I never expected to feel isolated when we had to undergo house quarantine. I knew we'd be together more than what I was used to, and that scared me. I mourned the glorious spring break I had planned for myself. The quiet, the day drinks, looking a mess and focusing on all the art I had intended to create while the kids were at school. But what I found is more time, not uninterrupted, but enough to focus my thoughts, to create the art I wanted, and to truly enjoy my children. Underlying every moment now is an appreciation for our daily closeness with a recognition of my privilege to be stuck at home with them. Strangely enough, it took an act of extreme closeness for each of us to find ways to make space for being alone within our closeness. Being alone right now doesn't feel like something I need to strive for or that I'm missing out on, but something that we all know we can take when needed. And together is not something we are by default, but something that we're asking to be. Although a shower without someone needing a glass of milk, that would be really nice. Beautiful.
Thank you so much, Zoe. That was absolutely stunning. Oh yeah, yeah, you guys are amazing. Okay, so <clears throat> I would like to introduce the artist Rachel Papauser. Rachel, please begin. Thank you, Marissa. <clears throat> and thank you to everybody that's joining us today. We really appreciate having you all here. Isolation, togetherness. It's the end of March. I'm standing at the kitchen sink, rinsing vegetables that we just bought. I'm trying to be responsible, trying to be safe. I'm listening to an interview with Dr. Sanjay Gupta on COVID-19, and I'm looking for any new information to make this all feel a little bit better. Towards the end of the interview, as he's explaining how the virus works, he says, it takes away your surfactant and the ability for your lungs to actually function. He said the word surfactant. And I'm immediately thrown back to another time and another place and my chest tightens and I wanna cry. I do cry. I've already been frightened for my family and for the world, but that one sentence makes everything feel like a more personal and surreal nightmare. Isolation and togetherness are more aptly isolated and together is a familiar place for me. It's where I lived when my son was sick and for a long time after he died. Like the doctor said, without surfactant, your lungs can't function. I'm a carrier for surfactant B deficiency and my second child, our son Jordan, died because he would never produce surfactant. This genetic issue is so rare that he had to be born for us to know that this was something in our family. So COVID-19 takes away your surfactant and the ability for your lungs to function. And I know what that looks like. It looks like every day in the NICU, watching my child need more and more oxygen on bigger and bigger machines, struggling to breathe and I'm powerless to help. It looks like being completely isolated in my head and in my grief, while also being constantly surrounded by people, nurses, doctors, these amazing humans who work so hard and try to fix what sometimes isn't fixable. And it looks like being there and holding him when our seemingly big, healthy, and beautiful baby boy died at a month old because he just couldn't breathe. And so I stopped making art. I didn't paint for almost two years. The first time in my life that I'd ever not created for longer than a week. There didn't seem to be a reason to that made sense and I had put a hold on joy. I did eventually start making art again, and through much testing and some losses, I had more kids. I realized that I needed both for me to be able to breathe and that that was reason enough. And so here we are now, isolated together. Better, but still in some ways the same. I'm together with my family in this, but I feel isolated in my head and in my constant mental vigilance as if worrying can help keep my three living children safe from harm like it couldn't for my son. But this time, even though I'm scared, I'm making art, I'm painting, because I've learned from experience that the only thing that I can really control is what I choose to create. Rachel, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I would like now like to introduce the artist Karen Mazur. Hi everybody. Asynchronous lives, a destabilization story. I lay this gift before you. It is nothing short of magnificent. This is our collective broken heart. First, we grieved, grief for what we used to believe, that there will be more time, that this life can even seem too long. How did we know it would all come to a halt, but that the seasons would continue to cycle? We don't know what we are supposed to do with this information. Have you stopped grieving yet? I am the master of my mourning. Perform hard work, stay hygienic, hands are chapped, self-care, family care, sew masks for the war effort. We wanted to live through interesting times. Interesting times are hard on the nerves. 
What is your video set? What costume will you wear? Baker, seamstress, headmistress? Nobody goes to school anymore. There are no dance classes. Eighth grade is over. Figuring out college life? Maybe never. There are no more young children in this house. No more young mothers. There is a dis this is a dispatch from a homebody. The homebody embraces all of the broken souls inside. We swirl about trying to be well, trying to be good. Is everything all right? Sure, can't complain. This is our collective broken heart, our war-torn souls, our worn out souls. Beauty grows in the ashes and we are in the fire, dancing an ancient planting dance that we don't even know we know. Do you know? What fuels this fire? Here is the story's conflict. It's punctuated by the beauty of the morning pink sky rising over the mountain ridge, the innocence of the chicks scratching and peeping nearby. The bodies pile up. It's said, we are all in this together. Our neighbors over there need for their kids to go to school for a couple of meals and some consistent structure. They needed that job. They were going to leave that asshole after their daughter got through the school year. She was going to win an award this month. She was going to do a solo at the choir performance. What's happening there now? Who's paying attention? We are all in this together. This is the story of a free market that isn't free. This is the story of lives lost for that last paycheck, for the illusion of security in a manufactured world that you built with your own sweat. If you didn't build it, you're sweating now, because how did they do it? How will we rebuild? What will this new world look like? We don't know what it'll look like. Where do we go now, Moses? We need you to tell us, all of us out here wandering the desert. We need to know how to be helpful and holy. We want to be human. No answer. So bake that bread, sow for the war effort. Vanquish fear and act bravely with love as your weapon. Love for your art, love for your children. There will be scarring, but scar tissue is strong. It supports the healing of broken hearts. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Karen. That was absolutely lovely stunning gorgeous um i'm so unbelievably grateful for these 12 artists who are performing um just for one second i'll retell everyone we are hoping unless we've instructed you to that you're uh looking at at each um performer in speaker view um, rather than gallery view, which is what I'm in right now. Um, you don't have to do that. You can, of course, view however you're viewing. Um, but just so you can kind of see Karen's piece was very atmospheric. And so seeing it nice and large on your screen is how um, we're hoping that you're seeing it. So please go into speaker view during the rest of the performances and we'll tell you otherwise, like when Mira performing, performs. So without any further ado, we will go to our next artist, Linda. Um, Linda, Linda, <laughs> Linda knows that I've been saying her name improperly, <laughs> but uh, Linda Trotshaw, did I do it okay? <laughs> show, <laughs> Trot a show. <laughs> um, thank you, Linda. We're so excited to see you perform. Alone, together, alone again. Not quite a quarter of a century old, I had a precise plan with a bulleted to-do list of accomplishments, a timeline, a deadline, until my womb, a tight fist, grasped a fertilized egg, even as my arms pushed away the one who sowed it, planted you. I am so alone. Nine months of silent sobbing, fertilize my swelling breasts and belly. You swim in salty tears. Already you control me. I sleep a dozen hours a night and I'm still fatigued. Once a vegetarian, I now crave steak, taquitos, and barbecue ribs washed down with tart limeade. 
I'm not quite alone. Reluctantly, you blossom into this world, late, lovely. I fall in love with you. I kiss your nose, your fingers, your toes, your neck smelling sour from milk, the pulsing spot on top of your bald head, the same size as my engorged breast. My arms remain open, whispering our mantra, I love you so much, the most. You're mine forever. I am no longer alone. You make me smile. You teach me to love, laugh, live for someone other than myself. Everything is you and me. Everything is we. Until I meet the man who will become your father, the father of your brother, and later your sister. We are three, then four, then five. Each addition, an adjustment, a blessing, a sacrifice. You get into everything, spreading, shredding, flushing, a wobbly charcoal line drawn down the entire hall, 18 inches from the floor. I lock myself in the bathroom to read a page, a paragraph, a sentence. Frantic, pleading fingers reaching under the door. Mama, where are you? Mama, I need you. Let me in. Mom! I long for aloneness. When you are not in school, my time is taken with cooking, homework, soccer, play dates, driving here and there. I fall asleep next to you and reading The Giving Tree. Stolen moments snatched to create, each line must count. No time to experiment, to waste, to fail. I long for solitude. As you grow, you push away further. It's supposed to happen. I'm grateful for more time to myself. Eventually, you rightfully depart. Moab, Bellingham, Morocco. I feel relief to regain myself, my time, my space, my body, embodied. After some time, it is my fingers reaching under the door for you. Your visit, your call, your text. Where are you? I am alone again. A decade has passed since my womb was cut out, leaving space for my heart to grow heavy and full. You've been gone half a decade, perhaps more. Your absence, an amputee's phantom ache. I rarely cry. I'm not alone, nor am I lonely. I'm full, even fuller for having you in my life. Yet I long for those tight, tiring together days when I belong to you. Thank you, Linda. I would now um, like to introduce the artist Megan Jacobs. Meg Megan, you're going to have to unmute yourself. I'm not sure why, but it is not letting me unmute you. Thank you. Megan Jacobs, everyone. Super thin. Do you love me more than your phone? The voice of my four-year-old daughter asks earnestly. Her question catches me off guard, and even now, years later, I'm still thinking about it. Mothers are often shrouded in expectations of perfection. Pinterest perfect birthdays and the veneer of Instagram lives in which the ability to juggle motherhood, work, and domestic responsibilities are effortless devoid of the daily moral conundrums one so often faces. We must decide where to direct our attention as an expression of the multiple facets of our lives. That may be consoling a child or shutting the door to get more work done. My lived experience of motherhood spans a range of emotions, love, exhaustion, awe, frustration, and appreciation. While I know the glint of the clean houses and Photoshop children is a fallacy, I at times long for such effortlessness. Cloaked in motherhood, my identity is indelibly informed through my children. I see the world through a kaleidoscope of their loves and fears, yet while in the presence of their bright rays, I can at times hardly catch my breath. I long for a moment of uninterrupted solitude. A moment to pee alone would be a good start. 
And yet, when rewarded, I want to be back in their presence. I want to laugh at their zany comments about whether or not snakes need to wear girdles, and to wonder at their tenacity to practice unicycling over and over again until they can do it like breathing. When my son won a neck and neck race, and my daughter read her heartfelt poems publicly, their joy was mine, one and the same. During those moments, the boundary between self and other feels paper thin. If you were to shine a flashlight through their skin, it would glow red through mine. Yet there are other times when I want, need, time to be lost in the contrails of my own thoughts without the usual staccato nature of my domestic life, one so often peppered with interruptions. My son was born an artist, truly never seen someone so driven to make every single day. Whether it's a cardboard house, a stereoscope, or 40 sheets of paper taped together to make a large scale comic, his conception and execution of his work is like breathing, a necessary component to his life. In a letter to his art teacher, he wrote, art is a thing that makes me me. When I read it, the sentiment resonated. That's exactly what I long for. I seek to make art as an act of making myself more real, more whole, more me. Yet in the same paradoxical way that a mother can want solitude and togetherness simultaneously, my world wouldn't be whole without an expression of my children in it. Perhaps this is the conundrum of motherhood, trying to create a rhythm of love and presence for one's children while nurturing their interest and passions in the midst of keeping the heartbeat of one's own identity a flutter. Thank you, Megan. <clears throat> so now I'd like to introduce our last and fi our final artist, Mira. Mira Burak, thank you so much. I wanted to especially thank you for bringing all of these women together during your first exhibition of 516. As I told many people in the very beginning of this um, <clears throat> performance, it was your exhibition of 516 Arts where we, I first met all of these spectacular artists. Um, and I really wanted to thank you especially for making this happen. Um, so th thank you. Um, so without any further ado, um, for Mira's performance, we're going to start in speaker view and then she'll instruct us from there. Hello, beautiful people. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Um, I'm just so moved right now um, and I just want to start just by thanking my mother who has paved the way for me to even um, begin to express these emotions um, myself. And then to all the artist mothers who just opened up their hearts and their vulnerability in this writing prompt, um, you guys mean so much to me right now. And to all the mothers that are here listening. Um, I hope this really nurtures something in your heart and to everybody here who we all have a mother in one way or another. Um, and thank you, Marissa, again, for just being so open to everyone's ideas and um, nurturing this process creatively and curatorially. Um, before I start reading, I just want to invite everybody to lay down. I'm going to, I'm lying down. I'm going to lie down when I read and you can lay down on your floor. You can lay down on your couch. You don't have to lay down. You can imagine yourself laying down. Um, but uh, I'm going to start that way. When I don't know what to do, I lie down. I'm writing and reading this lying down. I want all parts of my body touching the earth. My head, my brain, my throat, my breasts, my arms, 
my lungs, my heart, my stomach, my vagina, my thighs, my feet, and my toes are all on equal ground now. There is no hierarchy. Everything is horizontal. This is how we existed in the first months of our lives. This is how we learned the earth was our first bed. Here, I ask questions and wait for the power of this integrated state to answer me. I feel held by the earth, cradled, comforted. I imagine the 4,000 miles underneath me to the center of the earth. I can let go. Where does our body end and the earth begin? Here. Where does our body end and another body begin? A mother knows. I have lived in the high desert of New Mexico for six years, and only once have I heard the sounds of the spadefoot toads. They live five to 10 feet underground until enough rain comes. Then they dig their way to the surface in large numbers, and we hear an orchestra of hundreds of croaking sounds. They are thrilled to be mating in a puddle after five to 10 years of living under the earth. They are usually invisible to us, but they are there, alive. There is so much that is invisible to us that is real. Viruses are invisible. Economies are invisible. People are invisible. Our current circumstances share stories of this unseen world, our interconnectedness are fellow beings of all kinds. It's reminiscent of those instincts I felt with my children when they are suffering or ill or can't communicate what they need. And I get a sense that seems to come from out of nowhere of how to respond. We all have this intelligence and yet it is often unseen covered up with more tangible, rational thoughts or not talked about at all. It's the proof of our inseparability, our power. New Mexico has more land than people. Here we see isolation and togetherness every time we get in our cars. Even in the most densely populated cities, the mountainous landscape is the backdrop. We can see more deeply into the horizon beyond our immediate environment. It's a gift of seeing a fuller spectrum all at once. They are not separate. They are not opposite. They are together. There are no extremes, but swaying middle grounds. I feel balance, calm, and connectedness. These are the answers I have received at a time of so much uncertainty. There is no other, mother and child as always. Okay, so everyone is going to be unmuted for a second. If we can all just applaud these 12 amazing artists. Hi. 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 Hi.